After the, uh, the lunch, he took me aside and he said, you know, I'm tired of being written about in all the books on Hoffa's disappearance. There were six books then, and each one of them mentioned that the Irishman was a suspect in the disappearance of Hoffa. He said, I, I read your book, The Right to Remain Silent in Jail. I like the way you write. I'd like you to write a book that proves that I had nothing to do with Jimmy Hoffa's disappearance. And um, how about it? And I thought, well, you know, that's a silly idea. Uh, you, you really can't write a book like that. But I might get some, uh, some dialogue from him. He's a colorful character. So I agreed to meet with him at his apartment in Springfield, Pennsylvania. And uh, he opened the door and said, Charlie, this is my lawyer, Charlie Brandt. This is my other lawyer. Jimmy Lynch, the Catholic. And that was his name. He was uh, short like me, but puffier. And he was wearing a suit. Hiya, Charlie, how you doing? And uh, while we were standing there, the phone rang. Frank got on the line and was very humble. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then he said to Jimmy Lynch, the Catholic, did that matter? Frank stammered, so every once in a while I stammer. Did that matter? We, we, we got to go do it now. We, we got to do it now. And Jimmy said, now? What are we going to do with Charlie? Hey, man, I have work I brought home from the office. I can sit at your dining room table and get it done, and you guys go off and do whatever it is you do. And Frank said, no, bring him. It'll be good. So I get in the back seat of the car. It turns out it was the seat that Jimmy Hoffa was in when he was on his way to being killed. And um, uh, I had no idea where we were going. Jimmy Lynch driving, Frank sitting in the shotgun seat. And uh, we end up at a restaurant called the Mona Lisa. I'd never heard of it, Italian restaurant. We walk into the Mona Lisa, Frank first, Jimmy Lynch the Catholic, and me, and I can see a room full of mafia. We get in, and I'm looking at this, and all of a sudden I hear the click of the door being locked. <laughs> oh my God, it went right through me. People ask me, were you ever afraid in your years? I spent five years with Frank Sharon. That, yes, that time I was afraid. The build up to getting there, the the feeling of uh, where are we going, and the certain knowledge that if this were set up to kill Frank, get him out of jail and kill him, Jimmy Lynch and I would go too. That's how they do it. And uh, that click clicked, and then we sat, Jimmy Lynch and I sat at the bar, it was a round table, and there were these gangsters sitting around the round table. The guy sitting at the head of the table was uh, John Stamper, Gianni Stamper, he was, the head, he was the then head of the Philly mob, and it turned out it was a trial. When Frank went to prison years earlier to start his 32 years worth of sentence, sentences, uh, I shaved over 10 years from his uh, time in prison. Uh, and when Frank um, uh, went to prison, he had what they call money out on the street. He was a loan shark, and some money was out there, and there were two guys who were collecting the money for him, giving half of it to the then boss, little Nicky Scarfo, and saving half of it for Frank the Irishman. Only they claimed they gave it all to Nicky Scarfo. Scarfo was then in jail, five years of, um, of uh, excuse me, five life sentences for five murders. And he said, no, no, they never gave me any money. So this was a dispute over money, and this was the mafia trial uh, a system that would soon be put out of business by the Mafia Commission case in, in, uh, in the years to come. But at that time, it was a thriving uh, enterprise. And uh, they spent five hours. I got to meet Russell Buffalino's underboss, Billy D'Elia, and uh, I got to hear this trial unfold. When it was over, we went to Frank's house, and I had him to myself for five hours. 
He'd been drinking wine. And I ended up getting from him 80% of what happened to, Jim, to Jimmy Hoffa. How he was killed. At that point, nobody had any idea whether he was strangled to death, whether he was uh, beaten with a baseball bat, whether he was shot. But uh, I, I then knew 80% of it. The 20% that he didn't give me was that he's the one who had pulled the trigger, but I knew he had. That was what I did for a living. I'd written a book about it. I'd, I'd in, instructed police and uh, other lawyers what to look for, how to tell when somebody's telling the truth and when they're not. And um, I knew he'd, he'd been the trigger man, and I knew from his sense of remorse he was very... Uh, deeply affected by what he was telling me.